Om Shanti. So this uh, is about karma. And I will talk a bit now until our break at 10.30, uh, which is for half an hour, not a second more. And then, um, and then we will have chit-chat. So you're welcome to prepare questions, and any question is acceptable, even if I can't answer it. That's okay. <laughs> so, uh, karma. What's up? Hmm. Okay, karma is a very simple and very complicated. So I will do a little bit simple and a lot complicated. I hope that's okay. Also, there is something called drama. Have you heard about that? Drama. So, you know, in our early morning class today, it was suggested to us that for the entire day we should think of ourselves as actors. Can you do that? And there's a performance going on. It's a movie, a three-dimensional movie, and we're all actors in it, and we're the audience as well. And uh, uh, movies are for the purpose of entertainment. You pay good money to see people being shot to pieces and thrown off the tops of roofs and, you know, all sorts of things like that, which in, in real life would be considered awful, but in the movie it's entertainment. Right? Yes? Okay. So, um, so for today, we need to think about life as a 3D movie just for today at least. And that the purpose of it is, I think we better call it edutainment, it's a bit educational as well as entertaining. And uh, the reason why it's a good idea to think of it as, as entertainment is so that we do not get overwhelmed and overcome by the horrific things that occasionally do happen in life and uh, which make us or break us. Hopefully it makes us. So karma is action. So we have lights, camera, action. And karma could be good or bad or neutral three possibilities. And there are consequences of karma. So every time you uh, do any action, there is a result, which is called also the fruit of karma. And you could have sweet fruit, you could have bitter fruit, but whatever it is, when the fruit comes, you have to eat it. So better if it's sweet. But when it's bitter, you have to take the bitter fruit. So there's a lot of acceptance involved in um, working with the idea of karma. Now, karma could be a thought. That would be an act of mind. Anytime you think anything, that's karma. Even the things that you don't even notice you're thinking is still karma. There are still consequences. You still have to take the consequences of it. Could be a verbal karma, anything you say or write. There's also karma. And any other kind of physical action you do. And the way that you interpret circumstances things that happen to you, this is also karma, I see. So at every step you are free to do good or bad or, I'll tell you about neutral later. Um, good and bad 
in terms of the laws of karma, may be somewhat different from what you're used to in terms of good and bad. And um, so I will define it a little bit more precisely and then you can see if you agree with it. Um, there's a context in which we do our karma and the context is the consequences of whatever had gone before. So you may have attended some sessions where it was described that you're a soul and that you're eternal and immortal, is that right? So, you know, eternity is extremely long time. And it's a bit mind-boggling to think that there has never been any time when I personally, as an individual me-self, did not exist. So that's already quite heavy. And we have no clue what happened before our current lifetime. So in BK, we always talk about multiple lifetimes. And we think that you could have a minimum of one. Some people have only one lifetime, that's a bit short. And then a maximum of 84 lives in any cycle of lives. And then there's unlimited number of cycles. So, you know, gazillions of years and you have never not been you yourself. You cannot become somebody else. So the self that you are may get a different body and you have the exact same number of um, male bodies as you do female bodies unless you get an odd number of lives, in which case one is slightly more than the other. But on the whole, um, when you think of yourself like this, that you're not either male or female, but you have the capacity for both in there somewhere. But you're still the same self. You can be the same self in male format or the same self in female format. And the way you present yourself in, in different lifetimes depends on many, many things, and mostly your script. So, the other aspect which complicates the whole thing a lot is everything is predestined. But you don't know what it is until it's over, in which case it's history. So, all these are ideas. Do not think of what I'm telling you as facts because facts you can argue about, ideas you have to think about. So these are ideas. And the purpose of an idea is to think about things maybe differently from the way you're used to thinking about them. That gives you a, a different angle on things, a different perspective. So there you are in the present moment. You have some kind of past and some kind of future. And whatever is in the past, you can remember some of it. And whatever is in the future, you may have some premonition of it. Sometimes people are sensitive to the future in that way. So you, you can remember the past, and actually you can also remember the future because things happen in cycles so that um, at any point in the cycle of time, if you say that point is the present moment, whatever is clockwise forward is future and clockwise backwards is the past. And if you go all the way back to the beginning, then that becomes the future. So, right? The future keeps coming towards the present, then you experience it, then it goes into the past, and keep going and it becomes another future. So that means it is a, um, it's a fixed thing. It's inside a circle. 
and the totality of that circle corresponds to all the possibilities there are within you individually. Are you following me all right? Yeah. Now, every time you experience anything, you experience it actually not out here, but in here. Right? You have eyes for seeing, and whatever you see out here is actually registered in your brain and in your mind and in your soul. So where it's actually occurring in terms of an experience is in your being, and then otherwise it's out here. So you're already working with two dimensions, the outside and the inside. And all the other people experience what you see on the outside, they see it from their angle, so it's a bit different. And uh, uh, there's a wonderful Japanese story, and I forgot its name for a minute, which talks about a murder, and which is seen by four different people, and none of them see it the way it actually is. So, what is real? It's hard to say. So, we're going to be talking about perception. And we're also talking about a calculation. So, if we're good in maths, that's good. Um, but you have to also be quite good in subtle perception as well as calculation. So, in the soul, they must have told you that you have an intellect and you have a mind, yeah? So, your mind is uh, where you experience things. Sorry, I'm too hot when I talk too much. <laughs> uh, so, in your mind, your mind is like an organ of perception. And your mind will perceive the things that your sense organs allow to come in. And then you also have a focus of attention. So when you are focused on something, you will experience that more than the things that, that are in your um, peripheral vision, for example. And there may be some things that you don't notice, so then you don't experience them, even though they're there they might as well not be. You see, it can get quite complicated. So, then the other thing we have to uh, be aware about is that we have emotions, we have feelings about things. And we think something is pleasant, something is unpleasant, something is good, something is bad, something is nice, something is nasty. Uh, and then the other thing is we have ego problems. I guess everybody has one, right? And this is very important because it's a, um, it's a mask that we use and which is very brittle. And uh, sometimes we get fused with our mask. And when we get fused with our mask, then um, it, we become reactive when any attack happens to our mask. That attack happens to us, right? So, uh, in spiritual practice, we always think that we should unfuse from all these masks. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes? So, um, we actors, and many masks, and we have a right to our masks, and they're good masks, as long as we know that they're masks, because we use them. You see, right now I'm performing the role of talking to you, and I have a mask of whatever this is, and then when I go and have lunch with you, then I become somebody else, a different mask, you know. And we all do that. And when we um, are doing karma in a state of being fused with our mask, there is a risk of doing negative karma. 
And what we are trying to do here is minimize that risk. And for that, we have to practice to be detached. So uh, one practice is to imagine yourself to be about maybe two inches behind your eyes. So there's a distance between you and what you're seeing. And what that practice does, it gives you an edge, a second or two, between how you feel yourself to be and what is happening that you're perceiving. And it gives you an option to choose how you're going to respond to it. So you become more proactive than reactive through this practice, and that's quite useful. Now, when you look at another human being, and you see their face, their face is... Can you take off this fan? Yeah, their, their face is anyway a mask. And you can read a person's face because it's the window of the soul. So whatever is the facial expression, that will indicate what's going on in your mind, in your heart, in your feelings. So you pick that up when you see another person. And people have body language, so you pick up that as well. But um, we have a tendency to identify with our gender because it's pretty visible. Yeah, this is a man, this is a woman. Oh, yeah, yesterday I saw this guy who was all dressed up in a sari and I thought, you know, the feet are a bit large. This is not a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I was seeing him from the back, and then I went around the front, and I said, yeah, he has a big beard, so that's definitely a guy. Um, <laughs> but nowadays, you know, a lot of people are not quite sure I'm a man or I'm a woman, or sometimes I'm a man, sometimes I'm a woman. So um, it used to be a big problem, but now it's so common that it's kind of normal. And people are not upset by that in the way they used to be. But in spirituality, we have to really think, you know, I, I, I have all possibilities inside me. I could do anything. I can perform anything I want. And then you also have to see that inside you, there are individual characteristics that are personal to you in a configuration that cannot be replicated by any other person. So we each have our individuality, and we are very, very different from all the other people, including the ones who we think are very similar to us. They're very similar for the first few days, and then after a while you think, I don't know what I saw in this person being the same as me. It's not. Because as you have layers, and you go deep and deep and deep. And, and part of the practice of spirituality is to figure out who am I? And, you know, I mean, somebody told me the other day that there's 50 different people in you. I said, okay, that's fair enough. But, you know, there's many people. And different personalities emerge at different times for different purposes. And some people are very straightforward and simple, not too many people in there. And some people are very complicated and um, difficult to deal with, but that's okay. Everybody has a right to be who they are. And not only that, it's impossible for you not to be who you are. So when anybody asks you as a child, what do you want to be when you grow up, which is an odd question, I already am, thank you very much, go away. <laughs> you know? What they mean to say is, how do you want to earn your living? Oh, that's another question. But how a person earns their living very often is taken on as a mask with which you fuse. And then you say, well, I'm a doctor, I'm an engineer, I'm a whatever it is that my um, study and uh, livelihood uh, is based on. But that's not our identity. Our identity is the whole thing and then we express that in our karma. And our karma 
depends on how strong we are. So I would suggest that we should give up the idea that there's good people and bad people. And more consider that when a person is in their power, then they perform karma that corresponds to their essential self, which is very pure. And then when a person's not in their power, then they perform karma which is at odds with who you are, and at odds with what you are, and which is also against your own conscience. So the conscience is a very important little feature in the whole question of karma because if we act according to our conscience all the time, um, chances are you're authentic, you're real, you're doing pure karma, good karma. And then I, I found, I researched this a fair amount, that most people go against their conscience about six, seven times a day. Is that right? Usually over small matters. And why would we do that? It's the oddest thing. You know, because it's not somebody else's rules, which is understandable, you would break them, but your own rules. Why would we do that? And my conclusion is only because you're not strong enough to go according to your conscience. So you need strength. It's very expensive to do the right thing. It's very cheap to do the wrong thing. Most people will tell you the opposite, but I find that, uh, no. You need strength to, um, what sometimes people call it moral fiber, but I don't, really like that expression, moral fiber, because I'm against the idea of morality. But I think morality uh, causes difficulty in people's karma. And the reason for this is that it is enforced with some degree of violence, which is contrary to spirituality. What do you think? Yes, no, never thought of that before. <laughs> anyway, the other thing is that it, it tends people towards dishonesty. So that's another reason why I don't like it. And a um, few other reasons I won't go into now because we're going to go with karma. So when some circumstance comes up in front of you, very often it requires you to act. So something comes in front of you, it requires you to act, and then you decide what you will do, or what you will say, or what you will think, or how you will feel. There's a decision involved in that, and it's all very, very fast. This is why it's good practice to put behind your eyes so you get at least another quarter second to figure out what you're going to do. And you have to connect with your conscience, which is a rapid thing, and then uh, you have an instinctive conscience. And then it will tell you, okay, you should do this and then you either do it or you don't do it. Now, when people go against their conscience six, seven times a day, every day for most of your life, starting at the age of about four or five, that's a lot of times to go against your conscience. And the problem with that is that it causes your conscience to become dysfunctional and therefore unreliable. This is why you need morality, so if you don't know what to do, then you will consult with somebody else who may or may not have your best interests in mind when they advise you. So the external moral authorities who advise you, first of all, you'd be your parents, 
And if they're good, then they do have your best interests in mind, but not everybody has perfect parents. Anybody has perfect parents? No, they're just people, they're just humans, you know, like the rest of us, so they have their imperfections. Then come your teachers, you know, who are also just humans like everybody else. And then the third set of uh, external moral authorities is the religious leaders. Then you may have, you know, the government, the media, and various, you know, external uh, groups of people or individuals who let you know this is right, this is wrong, in this culture we do like this, in that culture we do like that, this is us, that is them, you know, all this sort of thing. And it interferes with the voice of conscience because many times your conscience will say, no, 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 you can't do that, that's not right. But if you do what your conscience says, you will be heavily penalized. So you have to be very wealthy so that you can pay the price. Wealthy not just only in money, but in personal strength to endure whatever the payment is. So it's complicated. So we say, okay, I choose to perform karma that corresponds to my integrity and my actual authentic self, you see. But you come up against these situations where it will cost you and then you have to see, are you strong enough to do it? And most people aren't. So, in a spiritual practice, one of the things we want to do is to strengthen our soul, which we do with meditation. And I was telling you a little bit yesterday morning how I meditate, or more or less. And you have to take the strength, you have to take light, so that you can do. And uh, if you begin to uh, act and think and talk and write according to your conscience, the dysfunctionality of your conscience gets sorted out and it starts to be very reliable and very functional. And uh, another consequence of that is that you can tell who's lying. This is very convenient. You know, because the worst thing is if somebody lies to you and you don't know, you get deceived. That's a big mistake to get deceived. So if your conscience is working well, you will not be deceived because you'll immediately see that this person is lying or this person is doing something that's not true. So this uh, well-refined uh, conscience is the most valuable instrument that a human being can have and you refine it and, and upgrade it by following its voice continuously and regularly at any cost, which is always very high, so sorry about that. And uh, then also it activates your perception that you can see, for example, you can see the future better so before it comes, you can see it coming. That means you're ready. It doesn't take you by surprise. This is also very convenient because then in advance you know how you're going to respond to it. Like a tennis player will understand what shot is coming and you're ready and you do what you have to do. Yeah. So this is karma. And. Uh, there are days when you decide, I am going to do a wrong karma, and I have a right to do a wrong karma, and that's what I'm going to do, right? Have you had days like that? Of course, you must have. You know, I choose to mess up today. Okay, fair enough. You know, we have rights. And so then you have to calculate, do you want to pay that price? You may say, yes, I'm going to do it anyway. Okay, fair enough, do it anyway, but you will pay the price. If you enjoy that, that's good, you have a right. Um, so, one very important thing about the knowledge of karma is said to be the ability to see 
the three aspects of time, the past, the present, the future. So, you're in the present moment, some circumstance comes along in front of you, and generally speaking, you will respond to that circumstance in the way that you have historically responded to similar circumstances. That is the way people are made. And the word we use for that is sanskara. You've heard this word, right? Sanskara. And so we are in a way predisposed to have breakfast the way we always have breakfast, take our shower the way we always take our shower, drive the way we always drive, walk the way we always walk, be stupid the way we always be stupid, you know, look good the way we always look good. So we have all these habits that we do. And um, when we're learning about karma, we find ourselves looking at all these different elements that play in the game of karma because we start to realize that um, it's up to me what kind of future I want. And whatever karma I do now dictates my future. Can't do anything about the past, so the best thing about the past is to just let it be the way it is, it's fine the way it is, no problem. Um, in the present, the present moment is like a, a, a razor's edge in between the past and the future, and it endures for, let's say, one second. So in that one second of the present moment, you are free to do what you want to do or think or say. But as soon as that second is past, it's over. It's history, there's nothing you can do about it. And you just have to take the consequences. You can't say, oh, I'm sorry, terribly sorry, I didn't mean to say that. So when we're very conscious about this stuff, we tend to be a bit more accurate so that we don't make mistakes. When we make mistakes is when we're inattentive or we are um, upset, emotionally upset by something or another, or we are weak, you know. So if we are emotionally upset, it's connected with being weak. So, again and again, my conclusion is that our problem is we're not strong enough. Which is why meditation is good, because it keeps on making us more and more strong. And strong means that you're faster and you're more competent in whatever it is you want to do. Uh, another as aspect is that you're expecting to be held accountable for whatever you do. That's a good um, headspace to be in, you know. Being actors, you're always on camera, right? I'm on camera, but I forget about it. <laughs> um, somebody's watching you all the time. You yourself can watch yourself all the time. It's not nice to be hypervigilant, that's too stressful, but just uh, find a, a sense of awareness where you just um, practice to be a little bit on the side of yourself, so you're looking at yourself, not like 24-7, but whenever it's necessary, whenever it's important, take a look. And whenever something goes wrong, you can replay that scene because you have an internal replay button. You know, all these video machines are very useful for that. And try to watch yourself. Now, what did I do that I didn't intend to do? Or where was I inattentive? Or uh, where was I under the influence of some other person or some situation. So we also need to look at influences, and there are a lot of influences. For example, 
it's a gray day and you feel you have a bad mood. So that's going to influence what you do that day. And um, by noticing the influences, you can also bring to bear choice. You decide. The, the external influence makes you want to feel rather moody and uh, like that, but you decide you want to be moody that day or not. Does it serve you well? You know, or do you just want to spend time being moody? And you have the right to do that, but you decide, yeah. Oh, today is a perfect day to be melancholy, so I'm going to be melancholy all day, and that's just that. Anybody doesn't like it, it's too bad. I will go take a walk in melancholy and write melancholy poetry. That's okay, you know, because you have a melancholy self too, you know. So sometimes the circumstances will activate particular personalities that are inside you. And it doesn't make you schizophrenic. You have a right to all these internal people because it, it, um, it makes for the richness of who you are. But the, the other thing that you n don't necessarily want is, um, you know when people are in survival? A lot of people are in survival. Um, then th that's a very big influence. To be in survival means that, you know, some drama has happened and you're surviving it. You know, you come out of a war or some horrible situation or a dysfunctional family. Most people grow up in dysfunctional families, right? So that's also going to influence how you handle things, you see. And so a very important part of studying about karma is that you go back to all of these influences that when you are a child it goes straight in, no filter. And that's it. It's, you're scarred for life, you know. But then you can um, turn it to your advantage once you understand it. Once you, you have to understand your wounds and your handicaps and all of these scars and so on. You have a right to them but you don't want to be victimized by them, but that's optional. So, um, whatever happens to you, you can say, oh, it's my karma, this bad thing happened to me because I deserved it, but actually it's better not to do that, because it's depressing if you do that. Much better is to say, okay, this thing happened because is good, teaching me something about humanity, about life, about, you know, what the world is. And um, you acquire special skills by, by looking at it like that, you know. Otherwise, uh, you just say, oh, this bad thing happened other person, you say, you, you deserve it, you're a bad person, this is why. No, it's nothing like that. You have to sometimes say, it is destined. This thing had to happen. Whatever it was, you just say, it, it is what it is. Now, how did it impact me? What am I going to do with this impact? to make it profitable for me, and to my advantage. Because it has that possibility, it's up to us if we use it to our profit. And I think the importance of learning about all this is to be able to take anything and make it profitable. What they say, make lemonade out of lemons, whatever, you know. So these things, whatever happened to us, they may be really horrible, but they contain deep wisdom for us to enable us to transcend the ordinariness of our condition. And so the attitude of somebody who 
really works with the idea of karma is whatever it is, it's okay. And if I had to do this whole scene all over again, I would do it the same way. I wouldn't change anything. Because the enriching, valuable gems that come out of it um, are the best. So our relationship with good and bad and so on is ultimately is good because it's to my advantage. And it's never too late in life to begin to think about these things um, in a way that is very, very personally profitable, right? Now, have you ever tried to change another person? <laughs> right, yeah. Abs it's, it's a waste of time. <laughs> because, you, you know, if you apply this idea that everything is predestined, then that person is destined to be the way they are, and why would you use your valuable time and energy to make them something different which they cannot be? Better is to come back to the self and say, okay, being as these people are this way, how am I going to handle myself? You have to drive defensively in this area. So sometimes give them a wide berth, enjoy your karma, see you later. <laughs> you know? and sometimes you actually live with these people, so it's a bit close, or you still have to work it out. And uh, you can t tell yourself that, okay, I'm living with these completely impossible people who are specially designed to make my life miserable, and I have to find a good way to take advantage of that situation so that I am, um, I come out of it really skilled and probably egoless, because they really do mess up your ego, don't they? And they're, they're specially put there for that. And then as soon as you have understood the lesson, learned the lesson, they will go away anyway, because they're no longer required. Some different person will come along. Yeah? <laughs> it's <was> worse. <laughs> because you're upgrading your <laughs> education. So it, it's like that. You know, if you're in school, the University of Life, and you pass any big exam, then you go to the next class, which is always more difficult. But you end up a wise and skillful human being, and uh, it's worth every penny of it. You know, these are expensive lessons, but you get what you pay for, so if you pay very high price, you get something pretty good. So that's all right. It's an investment. Okay? So, your karma. You have a situation, doesn't matter what it is, what you need to handle that situation is personal power. And in BK you will learn about the powers of yoga. Have you heard about them? Powers of yoga? Not yet? No, you will maybe later. Anyway, they're very good. Um, we have a picture with eight powers, but there's lots of other powers as well. But those eight are pretty good to start with. Tolerance. Can you endure the unendurable? Probably not, right? So you have to endure. Um, flexibility, the power of accommodation. How flexible are you? Can you flex with anything, turn yourself into a pretzel around all these situations and people? This is very useful. Then you have... Uh, discrimination, discernment. Can you tell what's really in front of you as opposed to what presents itself? Looks like this, really it's something else. Looks bad, really it's good. Looks good, really it's not that good. Power of discrimination, very good one. Power to make a decision. Can you make a good decision? Lots of people are hopeless at that. You know, they're really important. You decide, be decisive, make a decision, and take the consequences of that decision. Good, bad, or indifferent. If you make a bad decision, you can always change your mind, do it again, different one. 
um, power to cooperate. Can you, can you get other people to cooperate with you? Can you cooperate with other people? This is a very good karmic thing, you know, because you create lots of, um, like, um, you make little investments here and there, and you will pick up the benefit when you need it. You give, you take. The ideal karma between yourself and other people who you are interacting with continuously is to keep it in balance. So your give and take must be in balance. And your conscience will tell you when you've given too much or when you've taken too much. Then you have to pull back. Follow your conscience in that because it's a very good um, gauge for this. Uh, power to pack up. Pack up means something is on your mind uh, which is making you crazy and you can stop it. That's a very good power. Say to your mind, okay, we've thought about this quite enough. That's it now, you can do something else. So these powers are in the part of yourself we call the intellect. You know, there's some psychologists who talk about type one thinking and type two thinking. This would be the type two thinking. The mind would be the type one thinking. So you're... Um, strengthening yourself inside and you have multiple challenges outside which are simply there for the purpose of giving you practice to use your powers. And the other thing that you um, accumulate in spiritual practice is different qualities, different virtues. You know, these are very helpful um, to make sure that you are doing action which is all the time profitable for you. So you're in uh, good between you and your own body. Do you look after your body properly? Or do you not care about it? You have to take care. Because this is an important one. Make it last long. Don't abuse it. Your relationship with the nature you see, because how you relate to these things is how they relate to you. And your relationship with people, do you know how to love, do you know how to interact, do you know how to work, all these things. These are skills that you develop and it's all karma. And if you get it right, everything is nicely balanced and then you move along very happily. But it's a trick. Then you also have a karma with the divine. That's another thing that people don't know about too much. And if you are um, in your consciousness of being spiritual, you will be closer to the divine and you will feel when you're doing the right thing and when you're doing the wrong thing. So the right thing mainly involves absorbing light and power into yourself and doing things that correspond to your essential connection with that so that you don't do things that are antagonistic to your eternal relationship. And there your conscience will guide you in that as well. I don't know whether any of this made any sense to you, yes? Yes, good, okay, great. So now we will have our break. And um, I suppose the tea is in the room, dining room seven. And if you come back here by 11, Judy, do you have any announcement? Yes, a shortcut, go up and down stairs a few times, cross the hill, and then there's... And when you come back, if you're not fit, it'll... Om Shanti.
So um, I've got a microphone over here. If um, anybody has any question or comment or something, then it's probably good if you come up here and speak into the mic so everybody can hear you and it'll go on the recording. And as you know, you will receive the recording of all this on a stick at the end of all this, yeah? If you put it on your form that you wanted, yeah? So now, um, all the things, whatever I told you between half past nine and half past ten, is only some of the information, So, but there's so much. And uh, there may be lots of things I left out, but um, hopefully your questions or comments will stimulate me to remember what I didn't tell you, so that, that would be good. So, is there anybody who has any anything they would like to kick this off with? Please. Om Shanti. As you said that we have a birth from 1 to 84. So, a human being when it is born as a human being, so after the death, if he, even if he's doing the bad karma or a bad effect, will become a human being or will have a maybe annual life or any other life? Okay, thank you. Did everybody hear the question all right? Let me just repeat it for your benefit. Um, I mentioned earlier that we could have in any cycle of karma between 1 and 84 births. And suppose if somebody does a bad karma birth, will they still get born as a human being or might they be born as an animal? So in the um, study of Raj Yoga that we do here, we say that a human soul is a human soul and you will always, it's like a seed, you know, if you plant a cabbage seed, you're going to get a cabbage, not a tomato, you know, <laughs> and so <laughs> the, the human soul will, as soon as you plant it in a body, it's a human body, but you can have a dog's life, you know, <laughs> if you do really bad karma. So, you know, there's lots and lots of different lifestyles and, you know, you could be beautiful or not. You could be healthy or not. You could be wealthy or not. You could be stupid or intelligent. You know, so each and every part of a human being's life is a result of karma. So, if you want to be beautiful, rich, healthy, have good relations, uh, be intelligent, you know, like everything all in one go, so there is um, special karma that you can do in this life to ensure you can get that for multiple lives. So that's a pretty good investment. Yeah, you know. So all of this is possible. Yes, you have a question, come over here, do not touch the camera, that's great. Om Shanti, and thank you. Um, do you believe that genetically you have memories of uh, past uh, life and uh, that you um, eh, inherit karma from other and that that is writing in your DNA or or why you repeat pattern in your in your line family like in my case my grandmother my grandmother my mother and if I analyze my life, I'm repeating the same patterns that they have repeating. Hmm. You, do other people have that experience too? Yeah. So, yeah. Now, why do you get born in this family as opposed to that family? So there is something called karmic accounts and you will get born in the family where you have accounts. So, um, 
these patterns that you observe, which you say are in the DNA, the DNA is part of your body but not part of your soul. And uh, yet, the soul will be drawn to those parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, brothers, sisters and whatever, with whom you have an account. And your account may even uh, include health, um, pr what do you call it, um, pre predisposition. Yeah, my English, sorry. <laughs> Um, so it, it's complicated, but yeah, but from my angle, I wouldn't call it DNA because it depends on the karma of the soul. So when you die, your body will be left behind and somebody will have to dispose of it, but they will not be able to see where your soul has gone because it's invisible and it just disappears and it goes to where there is an account. And so it could be, you know, it's a very, very complicated thing, the account of the soul with other souls. You have an account with a particular country, with a religion, with a political system, with particular individuals, schools, and it's very complicated. But it is there, yes, definitely. And this is why we're very interested in learning about karma because we can decide to create like a track of karmic patterns which results in what we want. So a very important piece of homework I would give you is to write down on a very large blank piece of paper, what do I want? and then keep writing, uh, you know, and, and really, it's pretty easy to write down what you don't want, but the mind doesn't know the difference between yes and no. Have you tried to not think about a green apple? <laughs> you get a green apple, right? So. If you write down what you don't want, you'll probably get it. So don't write that, but really write what you do want. And you have to really think about what you want. And there are layers of it. And if you can identify very clearly what you want, then you can next of all write, what do you have to do, karmically, to get it? And then do that. Now you get it. It's very simple. It's one, two, three, A, B, C, easy but subtle. Yeah, please. Yes, if you come over to the mic, then it'll be one after the other, and you can make a line if you wish, or just jump in, whatever you feel comfortable. Uh, thank you for all, for all this information. It is very beautiful, very valuable. But I still have a question about the big picture, mm. which is the question why Basically, why all this drama? Why all the karma? And why do, why do we come to play this drama? So, yeah, the real. I think we all have some kind of answers to this question, but it would be nice to hear from you, please. Okay. Thank you. Why are we here? Basically, the answer is because we're here. <laughs> but. Um, the big picture is very, very deep question you're asking. There is a fixed number of souls. You cannot increase or decrease the number of souls. A soul is eternal and immortal, and there was no time when it began, as there will be no time when it ends. So you exist. There was nothing that caused you to exist. You exist. And inside of you is whatever can be manifested through your body in the material world. And it's contained inside you a little bit like in a, um, a computer file, you know. 
you have your audio, your video, and then the thinking part, and then you have the virtual body, which is actually a real body, and but it's similar to a computer game. And uh, this is why computer games exist, to help us to understand this. So there's a sort of very complicated tapestry where all the souls interact with each other over time and the whole thing makes the big picture called human civilization, which goes through many civilizations which we call Golden Age, Silver Age, Copper Age, Iron Age. That's you know, the cycle goes through those periods of time. And some of us start at the beginning, some of us start later on, some of us come at the end. It's, uh, you don't know. The thing to ask yourself is, who am I? And what do I do in this whole thing? And the best way to answer it is, what would you like? Uh, because it seems to me that what you would like, or who you would like to be, unless you're like really cuckoo, is who you really are. I know there's 500 different Cleopatras and all that, but if you really ask yourself the question deeply, who would I like to be in all of this humanity? And really, really look inside yourself. The who am I? And who do I want to be? You'll find it's the same thing. And that the ingredients for it are in there. At this time, the souls are very depleted, so we play our spiritually depleted, disempowered, <coughs> under the shadow of um, negativity role. Um, but when we are filled with power, no shadow, and we are in our perfection, then we play that way, and then we slowly decline, and then we rapidly rise. So it's a slow decline, rapid rise. And why is, uh, because it is there, it's like why climb, climb Mount Everest? Because it's there. And whatever is in you, it has to be manifested because it's there. And then when it's finished being manifested, then it collapses into itself until it's time to manifest again. So it's like you breathing in and out through eternity. I've heard um, human beings like to act out of good reasons. Yeah. And sometimes when we don't have a good reason, we make them up. Yeah. And this could sometimes also um, make us persuade our conscience. What do you think about that? Well, you see, you have to really ask yourself what kind of Repeat the question. Okay, the question is, human beings like to act. And maybe we make things up, right? And maybe it's contrary to our conscience. And we justify it. Oh, no, something else, tell me again. Yeah. That we as humans act. We act. We act. And we like to act out of good reasons. We like to act out of good reasons. And if we don't have a good reason? Then we make one up. If we don't have a good reason, we make it up. Fancy dress parties? Uh, I mean, do we persuade our conscience? Do we persuade our conscience? Mm. You see, this is a very good question. Um, justification justification. Because, 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 because. I did it because. I had to do it because. All these things are real. Um, you see, when the, your conscience is dysfunctional, you can sort of override it and push it aside and say, 
I am the external moral authority here, you just be quiet. This is why I'm, you know, suspicious of them. I've been asked about this, so I had to just uh, correct myself. Toxic conventional morality, that's what I'm against. Some morality is okay, but toxic conventional morality isn't. So, when you're really following your conscience, um, it doesn't get persuaded. It'll say, look here, who you think you are? <laughs> I'm the boss here. <laughs> right? And you can argue as much as you want, your conscience will bite. So it's okay. Don't worry, have faith in yourself, you're a good man. Okay? So, what would be the difference between guidance by conscience and motivation? What would be the difference between guidance by conscience and motivation? You have to see which one will cost you the most. And when you're guided by your conscience, it will definitely cost you the ma maximum, but what you get is worth having. The other, you pay a lot when you get nothing. You, you, you don't get anything. You pay, but you don't have any goods. You want a diamond, it's not going to lose its value by that. It's more expensive than the junk you can get for less money. But that's still more money than... It won't keep its value, you know. So it's not worth it. Economic good sense. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Om Shanti, and Om Shanti. thank you very much for all the stimulating ideas. There's so many things that are, it's difficult to concentrate on them all. <coughs> Sorry One about thing that. that I have been talking to colleagues and my wife and our leader in Edinburgh on some of the philosophy of BK that we find difficult to maybe accept and, or maybe don't understand fully. One aspect was some of the sort of fixed ideas and one of the questions at the beginning was about 84 reincarnations. So yeah. Why 84? But what you said immediately afterwards was these are ideas, they're not facts. Mm. Then again, another thing that you mentioned just now, which again, fixed us was there's a fixed number of souls so oh, yeah. who, who knows that and why is that the case is it an idea that's useful to think about or do, you, do people regard it as a fact well no it's a very useful idea um, I'll just repeat the question that there are many things that my brother has been discussing about the BK ideas and one of them is the fixed number of births, I mean maximum of 84, why 84, could be 94, doesn't matter really, um, because you, you're not going to track them like that, be interesting though. But um, uh, fixed number of souls, you see it, it's logical, if you are eternal and immortal, you cannot not be there, right? Anyone who's eternal and immortal must be there, always. And if you're neither eternal nor immortal, you will not be there. So that's a fixed number of souls. How many are there? Well, at the moment, population of the Earth is 7.4 billion or so. So we're getting to a point where there's enough, you know? And so it doesn't really matter how many, but what matters is for your own self, I exist. Um, it's a very important affirmation. I exist and I am acceptable as I am. And, and I am made up of good and bad. And uh, that's okay, that's the way it is. You see, toxic conventional morality tells you, take a cosmic scalpel, cut your indivisible soul in half, throw away the bad half in some cosmic waste paper basket. You can't be half a soul. 
you are indivisible. But you see, this toxic morality doesn't allow for black and white. It doesn't allow for the complete human being from bright to dark, from good to bad, from full to empty. Whereas what this is saying is you are complete in yourself and um, it's a bad idea to feel bad about yourself at a time when you're weak because you have a right to be weak and anyway you will be weak when you're not strong and once you're weak then you will get strong and then you'll be strong and then you will go through time and that will deplete you because time does that and as long as you come in a body you come in a dimension of time and space which is a depleting type of thing energy and motion goes away and that's the way it is so but the toxic conventional morality says first of all your soul is eternal except that it's not which is not true it can't be both then it says you have to be perfect, which you are already, but it says you're not because you have imperfections, which is included in your perfection, because perfection is about balance, not about extremes. So it's really just looking at yourself differently and knowing that who you are and what you are is exactly what you should be, and if anybody doesn't like it, it's too bad, you know? I think like that. Hmm? Just a, a follow up and to, to that is I can understand the logic and the argument. Um, the other aspect of say the number of souls, I, I would think why can it not just be infinity because the infinity of, or the, the infinity of the love of God is just, there's no end to it. So why? has there to be a fixed number of souls and not just an infinite number? I'll leave it at that. Well, you because can, I, you can so have many an questions. infinite number of souls, that's okay. <laughs> so you mentioned about human uh, souls. What about other type of... Uh, Identi um, identities or energies. We talk about angels, we do talk about <coughs> people coming from other planets. Mm. What's your idea about it? Well, I'm definitely from another planet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, in, in BK we talk about the angelic stage. So, um, in our practice, we are trying to finish off all our karmic debts, accumulate lots of karmic credit, and um, transcend the limitation of this body and enter into an angelic body. You have your soul, small point of light. You have your body, this thing here, leather bag with warm mud in it. And then you have a subtle body is made of uh, a kind of white shadow. And so when the soul is really pure and you enter into that, then they call that angel, otherwise it's ghost. And uh, so there's them as well. And then um, mm, we think that we souls, human souls, have a, a karmic account with this planet, not any other planet and maybe there's some other people somewhere else, but that's okay. And that's how we think. So the enlightened people, if I can say that soul that is really perfect, so subtle, so pure light, mm. in, in your understanding they have a karmic relationship with the earth and they can support people? Oh, they have to, that's their duty. Yeah. Yeah, because it's necessary, you know, because say, I mean, our idea is this, you take all the energy from God, put it in yourself, it's not just for you, you have to distribute it, you become like a channel, and you have to distribute 
that's your function. Otherwise, it's not fair. Hi. Sister Denise, good morning, and thank you very much for this morning, but also for yesterday morning. I really liked uh, you. your presentation, what you taught us. Um, my question is a little bit related to the bigger picture as well. Mm. Um, and I know, I think, some of us, and I'm one of them, um, do not have the knowledge you have, apparently. Mm. Um, maybe one step back, uh, can you enlighten us uh, on the, uh, the origin, uh, the basis of the information, like a brother talked about, the 84 mm. uh, souls, you used the word predestined, and mm. so much information. Where does this information, this knowledge, come from? Um, mm. Where does it originate from? Mm. Thank you, sister. Thank you. So some of you may be familiar with the Bhagavad Gita. So in the Bhagavad Gita, it d describes many, many, many of the things that we talk about here. And it also says that this knowledge of the Gita will be given again. And the idea is that there's a time when this information is given, coming from the Supreme Intelligence, is given to humanity, it's used, and then it gets forgotten. And then it gets put in a book in a format that you can learn, but that you can't use. It's rather like pyramids. Who's my pyramid brother? No, not here. Okay, there's one brother who's um, mm, knowledgeable about pyramids, and he was telling me yesterday that the pyramids have been deactivated because some pieces are missing, and the grid on the earth were messed up, so they couldn't function properly. So in a similar way, this knowledge couldn't function properly, though most of it is there, but there's a little bit missing. <coughs> Slow down. Sorry. Translators. Um, <laughs> so then, when the time comes, which we think is now, then the same source, the Supreme Soul, comes and tells it again. And then we have to understand it or not, as the case may be. And so that's what we think is going on at this time. So once you have the missing pieces, then you have to rejig your mind and intellect so that it fits, and then you can start to use it, and then you start to do the correct karma, because some p missing pieces about karma are there, some missing pieces about self-identity come there, some missing pieces about things like I mean, this 84, that's already been there. They know this word 84, but 84 what? They don't know 84 what. They say there's a cycle of 84, but 84 what? So 84 births for a human being, okay, in a cycle. And, um, and that a soul doesn't either become God or become animals or whatever. A human soul is a human soul, but it passes through De decline. Most people think that it progresses, um, but the progress occurs during this one period of time between this end and beginning, Alpha Omega period. So you have to take all the information and then all the spiritual power within one lifetime. <clears throat> so we're trying to do that, like that. What else? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, it's a vast knowledge, and it comes in <clears throat> like uh, basic bricks like children have, and then you gradually go to the CAD program by the time you grow up a bit and you get the architecture of the world. But um, you have to think about it a lot, and then you throw away what you thought about, and then you think about it differently over a long period of time. But yeah, it's very interesting. <coughs> uh, you invited me, so I'll take the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, predestined. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Where does that knowledge come from? That's also, I mean, well known in the world, but how to, how to think about it. And so the way we think about it is like this. Okay, you're an eternal immortal soul. You have your script inside you. You don't know what it is, but it's in there. And um, it, it, karma is also about cause and effect. So your last effect is the same as your first cause. So it's a uh, closed circle of cause and effect. And therefore, it stays within a, a piece that is you. So the, the whole thing is you. And at present, you have this body and you're in this time, so you're performing whatever you perform now. But then you study this so that you can think about it, so that you can understand yourself in totality as far as possible. That's the idea. And then go into your angelic form, which we just heard about, and then you can take the duty to take energy from that Supreme Source and fill it into the elements of nature and the people. Because if you can have direct connection, then that's good. But not everybody can do that. But if you can, then you have duty to fill up everybody else. That's a good duty. Yeah. Thank you. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Um, so I don't really know how to ask this question because I'm That's a bit right. confused about it. But um, it's just about um, like self-identity, and I'm just struggling a little bit with um, like this concept that my physical body is separate. I mean, I, I agree with that, and then you know the DNA is part of my physical body. Um, but when I'm asking myself who I am and there's like these certain characteristics and stuff that I associate with who I am. Um, are, are all souls the same? Do souls have characteristics? <laughs> because I sometimes feel like there's a visitor inside my body and I feel when I, the more I ask myself who I am, the, the less I, I know and the more confused I am. Yeah, it's a <laughs> problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there you are, you know, the camera's pointing at me, but it could be pointing at her. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on camera, I see, so that the people who watch this, which is you, will see it as well. Okay, so there she is. <laughs> and she's young, yeah, you were young. Yeah, and then sometime later you'll become old like me, and um, then you'll die. And um, this is your current costume for your current role, which endures for some number of years. And if you don't have any untimely death, then you know you'll get old normally, and then you'll die normally, and then you'll take another birth. And then a different character from inside you will say, okay, my turn, you know. And so you've got all these characters and there'll be sort of a dominant one or two in this birth. And then maybe in another birth you have another guy will be dominant and then the current one will be a little bit more merged, you see. And when you get a male body, then your masculine thing will come out, you know, and your feminine thing will be a bit merged like that. And so, you know, it's quite difficult to know who you are because you don't know who you are. It could be anyone. <laughs> but really, it's deep and subtle. And then you have to create criteria. You know, sometimes people say this expression to you with a finger wag, they say, I know who you are. You know, and what they mean is, I know that you're not okay. You know. And then you have to say, I know very well who I am, thank you very much. So it's like people try to destabilize your self-respect. 
So one very important thing in spiritual practice is to really stabilize. I know who I am, I know what my values are, I know what my principles are, and if you don't like it, it's too bad. So you have to be very assertive about that. And uh, one of the th reasons I don't like toxic conventional morality is because you get trained to not have faith in yourself and rather have faith external moral authorities who know better who you are. Actually, nobody knows better who you are than you. Um, but, you know, it's uh, some kind of a strange part of civilization that they like to disempower each other, especially children, you know. And then by the time you're 18, you all of a sudden become an adult and then you have your rights. Uh, it's so weird, that idea. But it's, it's in the legal system. So anyway, um, in this practice, you have to sit with yourself and affirm certain things which are told to us. You know, for example, you are fundamentally pure. You know, and what will the external moral authorities say? You are fundamentally flawed and a sinner and you probably should go to hell and we will help you not go there. And you have to say, excuse me, I am fundamentally pure, I am created by God, he's not going to make any mistakes, so go away. Right? And then I am a pure, peaceful, powerful, loveful, blissful soul. That's my base, you know. And then on top of that, I have my performance. You know, I perform this, I perform that, I perform the other. And when I'm weak, I make mistakes. None of your business is between me and God. Thank you very much, go away. So you have to kind of assert yourself. I, I know it's not a very popular thing to say, but that's what I think. Om Shanti, Sister Denise, uh, oh, actually sorry. I have two questions, if I may. Yeah, please. First one is, uh, when actually the soul is entering the body, so I mean, what is the time frame from the passionate moment till soul enters the, uh, enters the, enters the body? Um, if we say, okay, question, the question is, what is the time frame, when does the soul come into a body? You know when it goes out, when the vital signs go flatline, uh, when it comes in, is you know there is an expression, the quickening. Have you heard that word? Yeah, quickening. If you're a midwife, you will know. So when a fetus starts to move, that's the time when the soul enters. And many who are mothers will feel, okay, he is here or she is here, you know. And that's when the mother begins to have a relationship with that soul. And in general, it's about five months after conception. So the fetus has to have all the bits. And that's when the fetus decides which sex it's going to be. And up until then, it could go either way. So it's about small like this. And then you become like this. And then out you pop, and off it goes. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, the second question is more more tactical. So you said that, uh, and I think all of us experience it, that we want to change somebody, right? Now, I agree that there is no sense to change somebody. Nevertheless, if you, know, if you have relatives or people that are close to your heart, and they are doing things that are not good, okay, from my perspective at least, I think you should, and you are obliged to give them a feedback. Okay, not to change them, but to give them a feedback. Now the question is, can you give us some rule of thumb? You know, what, 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 what's the, what's the time frame, or what is the energy that we should invest in giving feedback till people, you know, um, notice they should change them, uh, that they should uh, change themselves, or you know, what is, what is the energy we should, we should spend on it? Well. Um as long as, say for example, you're a parent and you have a child, you need to give that child structure and love. Um, because the child needs to know what the rules are. And the rules have to be coherent and consistent. So you have a duty to do that. Um, 
<clears throat> Once you're dealing with people who are already adult, who you're not necessarily responsible for, but you're interacting with, the typical problem is somebody is an addict. And so they're on drugs or alcohol or whatever the thing is. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, it's not going to do anything. So there are some setups that you can do which involve, um, I suppose, a classic intervention is a good way to do that. Do you know what I mean by that? A classic intervention is where you get all the people who are affected by that person and they have to get that person in the middle of the room and everybody has to say without any emotion, when you do this, I feel this. So that the person starts to get it, you see. Because the problem with somebody who's doing bad behavior is they will deny it. And they will say, oh, this other person is much worse than me, that makes me okay. So the, a lot of people have worked on this, especially in addiction recovery, they have, have figured out these um, methods, which are very good. And they don't, not always 100%, but it's good. Um, if it's just one, your word against his, it doesn't work. You, you need to get everybody involved to say a coherent, consistent message so that eventually the penny drops. And it's not just their word against somebody, it's they're, they're experiencing the impact of their behavior on other people. And then you, what you also have to do in a classical in intervention is you have to tell the person what you want done. So if it's an addict, then what you want is you go to rehabilitation and then you have a couple of years psychotherapy and then you do spiritual practice for the rest of your life. And if you are drinking or using, you can't come in this house. And you have to apply what's known as tough love. You see. So you create boundaries and you have to be very consistent about it and very dispassionate because once it gets emotional then you know it's a free for all so um so th these are skills that you can learn and because the world is so messed up um there are people who've done really good research on this and and you can learn it and um apply it but in bk we have to, first of all, make ourselves very clear about who I am. We have to make ourselves non-dependent on those people. And um, we have to be really in our power. Because what happens is people, they try and provoke you, right? So you have to be unprovocable, and dispassionate. Like a sphinx. <laughs> That's important. And um, you, you have to also, I think, make it clear what you want and also the boundaries, you see. Uh, so if somebody wants to really behave badly, then somewhere else, not here, you know. And um, or it might be to do with money or this or that. And they try and uh, get you where you're weak because they're very good at that. And don't be weak. Something like that. Yeah? Thank you very much. Welcome. So we have just, uh, I'm not sure, Judy, do we finish at 12 or 12.30? 12 well, I think if we a bit early, it would just be because we have a 1.45 bus to Okay, so if... Yeah, if, unless anybody has any question, we can we can finish. Is this good? You have one? Yes, please. Okay, last one. Another one. Okay. Okay. Now, if you have questions, we'll carry on. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Thank you very much. Uh, I can you hold the mic a little closer to your ma mouth? Yes, I have two questions, or so one in two parts. Uh, 
Imagine I'm a soldier in a company to defend a village, and I have orders to kill the enemies. And option one, I kill them. And option two, I let them kill me, my company, and the villagers. What will be the add-on to my comic balance? Positive, negative, or neutral? Okay, first of all, it's a hypothetical question. The question is, um, I'm a soldier, and I can c kill the enemy, or I can let the enemy kill me and the village that I'm with. Uh, what will be the karmic consequences? So, number one, it's a hypothetical question, but nevertheless, a question that comes up very much in terms of military. So, from the point of view of karma, uh, if you're in the military, you have a duty to protect your country. And um, not long ago, I, I've been talking about this stuff to police and military, people who carry weapons for their job. And so usually I tell them, okay, when you have to shoot, make sure that if you have to shoot to kill, you do it in one shot. If you have to shoot to wound, you wound exactly where you plan to wound. Uh, do not be under any kind of emotional anything, but be very dispassionate when you discharge your weapon. Um, and uh, because that's their job, they have to. And um, this is the law of the land. So if you are in the military, you have to, but you don't have to rape you don't have to pillage, you don't have to torture. There's tons of things that people do, because they can, that becomes negative karma. So what I would suggest is if you are in the shooting business, no, you'd be a very good shot. It's just to understand, it's just to understand how to be reflecting on our karmic uh, accounts, what, what yeah, will but This is why I avoid hypothetical questions, because yes. uh, it's better to deal with all things. Yeah. Yeah. In the second part, mm. I, I want to join my Turkish friend mm. before. Uh, I, I'm feeling like very tired and worried about all those cycles, uh, golden age, silver, copper, iron. And it goes on and on again and again. Is there any way out? Is there any way out? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, show me the way to go home, right? Okay, so the question for in case anybody didn't hear it is I get terribly tired, golden age, silver age, copper age, iron age, all these cycles, can I get out? Yeah, you can. But at some point you have to come. So you decide the wonderful thing is that when you are not on the earth in a body, you are out of time. So if you are out of time for a billion years or one second, the duration is the same from an experiential point of view. So that being the case, it's enough rest. So, I mean, the, the, another way to look at it is um, just go inside to yourself and ask yourself, if I have to take birth, do I want just one birth? Is that enough? Yes? And one, one is enough? Or you want a few more? Too much? Well, you're here, so that's it, you know. Once you're here, you've got to come back. So, that, that, uh, that, but it's a very good thing to just ask yourself, you know, how much time do you want to spend on the planet? Do you want to miss any of history? You know, because it's pretty interesting to be there at the time, you know what I mean? I would think, I, this is my view of things. But um, you can go to Nirvana, which is very nice, light, peaceful, quiet. And you can stay there for a long, long time. And then you come down for a quick dip on the earth and go back again. That's also okay. Yeah, you could do that. Please. Okay, this will be our last question. Huh?
So the BKs and other organizations put a lot of energy to bring light in our world, to bring knowledge towards who we really are. Oh, we try. We try. Trying. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there is a lot of other kind of energy that takes power away, as you just mentioned, this yes. morale, mm -hmm. um, and whatever. So my question is, what about this, if I can call black energy or devil? Is there devil? Is there a purpose about trying to bring down um, the souls? Well, I mean, you know, the question is, um, we are trying to bring in all this light energy, but then there's all kinds of dark energy, like the dark web, right? You know about that? No? Yes? Well, there is a dark web also. It's got all kinds of dark things on it. All the hackers like it. Um, anyway, yeah, there is dark energy, very dark energy. And uh, I think that if you are going to be a person who wants to really bring light, then one of the things you have to do is to destroy the dark. And uh, that you have to face it. You have to not be afraid, because it's pretty scary. And you have to face it and make it disappear. And it can be done. But the thing is, there's a lot of dark energy now, a lot, very much. So that means we have to be very um, assiduous and uh, conscientious to, to bring in light, to be able to face that down. It takes courage, you have to have courage. On that note. <laughs> okay, Judy, you have something to tell us. Oh, you have another question. Oh, please, yeah. Yeah, we should finish on a, on a light note, right? <laughs> um, for me, it's quite difficult to, to get into agreement with the concept of God and uh, spirituality. Mm. But I think that, that uh, I agree with most of the part that we are energy, or there is energy, and the energy doesn't get destroyed or created. It just changes constantly, mm -hmm. and they are always there, and it have to flow. It's all changes, and it's all circles. Life is circle, nature is circle. So I can see that from the, um, from, from the uh, technical point of view that we are circle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, Spring, summer, winter, and with the toxic uh, moral that you said, basically all the religion, like uh, um, in in the in the years time, like Baba or Jesus or, or Mohammed or whatever, the beginning of this uh, issue is exactly the same. The message is exactly the same. It was only when men or human. Um, uh, institutional, institutionalized or hierarchized, mm. yeah, yeah. Uh, and they start to making the rule. Mm. Then, when it got to toxic moral issues, mm. and it happened with uh, Christianity, and it happened with the uh, Muslim, and it happened with Hindi, mm. and uh, it will happen with BK mm. if we carry on the same pattern. Yep. And my question is, why we make some? I mean. Why don't pay more attention to the message and not to the person who, to, me, to the messenger or to the institution? I, I suppose that it's easier to get the message if you, are, you have to have a framework. But the problem is they get, um, like with the time, they get degraded, the yeah, message. Exactly. And at the end of the day, the purity, when, when mm, uh, uh, Jesus was with the 12 apostles, I'm sure it was purity and conscience. Mm -hmm. and so I just want to know what you think. Yeah, I think it's absolutely right. And that um, most probably all these institutions, including this one, will vaporize. And then we'll be left with just the self. And if you, as an individual, 
connect and become a conduit, that's good enough. I think. Maybe scary, but I think that's probably what's going to happen. I thought we were going to end on. Can you create a nice light note for us to end on? <laughs> I think that is a light note. Be the light. Don't okay. be attached to institutions. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, be it. Don't get attached to anything. Be the light that you are. Yeah. Okay, so let's just have a moment of silence to conclude and then Judy will give us announcements.